1 John is where we're going to be and where we want to invite you to be with us. If you brought a Bible, would you make your way there to 1 John chapter 3? If you didn't bring a Bible, there's Bibles in front of you and the chairs in front of you you can grab hold of, page number on the screen so you can get there rapidly. You can use an electronic device if there's a Bible app that you prefer to kind of follow along in that. One way or the other, we want you to have the Word of God open before you so that God would speak to you through His Word. That's true here in the sanctuary. That's true in the overflow. That's true online as well. We want to invite you to make sure you have a Bible open and that you would follow along with us. And our great desire and want is that God would meet you this morning in his word. So let's ask him for that. Would you join me in prayer? Let's ask right now that God would open up his word to each one of us. Father, it's before us right now, your word. And I think about how powerful that is. I think about your truth, which you said would be a light that would shine in a dark place. And I love that you do that, but I'm asking for it now. God, would you work in the midst of us right now, causing your word to be a light that would shine into our lives and on the path in front of us? Would you give us understanding of your word this morning? And then would you help it to just connect? And Lord, you have an ability of doing this that I never could. Cause it to meet people right where they're at just each and every one of us differently and yet precisely as you can only do. Lord, we're asking for that. I'm asking for it. Give us ears this morning to hear what what you're speaking to each one of us. We ask for that together and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As the church began to make inroads across the world, and it just as it began to touch the world at the very beginning, it was a little bit confusing for some. As it began to spread through the Roman Empire, there were great questions about what is this thing, this thing that we call the church or Christianity. There have been a lot of weird rumors. Some had con- con- just concerns that maybe it was some kind of cannibalistic thing. You know, I mean, they'd heard about, you know, drinking the blood and eating the flesh, and they're like, I don't know, that just sounds weird, not understanding that they were speaking of communion. Others had thought maybe it was some kind of political zealot movement, you know, king of kings, maybe going to overthrow the government. Lots of confusion and weird reports had kind of just pressed into the the Roman world. And so in response, one of the things they did was actually send spies into the churches in those days in Rome, and the churches were there, underground churches that had begun to meet to try to figure out what they were doing and what they were intending. As those reports came back, they were in part reports that, you know, none of the, you know, concerns about it being cannibalistic or kind of a zealot movement were true. In fact, they came back saying, you know, they're talking about this guy, Jesus, that they said died and he's alive. He seems to be the center part of it, but they didn't really understand it. But one thing they noted, and the early historian Tertullian said that when they came back, they just reported and said, you know, see how these Christians love one another. And it might be a different translation, my, how these Christians love one another. It became one of the early reports out of it. They came back and said, you know, we don't understand everything, but these people, boy, they really do love one another. I want you to see that and understand that because in so many ways we think about that. That's exactly what Jesus said. Jesus said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said this is part of how the world would recognize us, that he'd be able to see us and say, you guys really do that. You love one another. Well, that's where we are this morning. That's the subject matter, but we're not just beginning it. Again, if you've been with us in 1 John, we've already kind of let you know that 1 John isn't this linear thought that kind of, you know, moves and then goes on to something else. It's kind of a circular thought that he talks about something and leaves it and comes back. So we've already talked about this before in 1 John. We're going to talk about it today, and we talked about it last week. We really began last week. Then we'll come back and talk about it again in chapter 4 and again again in chapter 5. So there is a sense that he's just saying it over and over, and we need to hear it that way. We need to hear what it is. And so understand it is a theme that God is pressing into our lives here in 1 John. May he cause it to be there. Well, with that, very specifically... I want to take a moment and just remind you about what we saw last week, because this section obviously is very connected, and maybe you were here, and so it's a good reminder. Maybe you weren't, and this will let you give a quick understanding of what it is, but with an encouragement, you might want to go back and see the whole study. We began with an understanding that 
love, the kind of love that's being talked about, it manifests or it shows or it declares or it shines what real salvation is. You might just go back there and see last week we saw it in verse 10. It says it this way, in this, the children of God and the children of devil are manifest. I mean, here's how you can recognize them. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. He calls us to be that. He calls us to walk in love and says, hey, this really defines it. And if you were with us last week, we talked about how that was always God's plan, kind of going back to what we talked about in chapter 2. And then we spent the majority of the time talking about this love and what it looks like deeply inside of us. And God contrasts it with hatred, with murder, with a murder that began at the very beginning in the book of Acts when Cain murders Abel. And we talked about how real this is, that the love of God that he's calling us to is this movement almost. It's this place that's real, that's not just something on the outside, it's something on the inside that changes our very hearts in the way that we feel and, and, and see these things. Now, I want to just draw your attention to that because as we connect it to this morning, I just want to tell you how much both of these need to go together. That in one sense, we saw that this love is real, that it's this genuine, you know, life change, this heart change that changes the way you feel about things and feel about God's people. And then today, we're going to be very, very practical. It's going to talk about how that's going to manifest itself out in action, but it's important that you see that it's not an either or, it's a both and, that there does need to be this genuine transformation of what's, ta- what you, what's happening on the inside of you, but then it needs to flow out into what's happening on the outside. So again, if you missed any of that last week, you might want to go back and get that. Let's pick up where we left off and let's read the section we're going to cover this morning, then we'll talk about it. So begin with me there in verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this We know that we are of the truth, and we shall assure our hearts before him. By this we know, or again, going back there in verse 16, by this we know love. Because he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. We begin to understand one of the first things he draws us to in this section is understanding how we know love, or love is known in Christ, that we get a chance of really understanding it, that love is demonstrated in Christ in a way that we never would have understood what real and genuine love is outside of seeing it in God, seeing it in Christ. Now, that love, the Bible lets us know, is a love that he loved us in our unworthy state. He loved us in rebellion. It gives it to us this way in Romans chapter 5. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says, you want to see what love looks like. You want to see a demonstration of the love of God. Then you need to understand he loved us not because we were lovable. We were enemies. We were enemies in rebellion, and he loved us in an unworthy state. He loved us, and we didn't deserve that love. He loved us in a sacrificial way, a a way that just caused him to respond to that. Jesus would say in John 15, greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friend. He says, there's not a bigger love than this. There's not something that's a greater demonstration of love or act of love than to give one's life away for somebody, but that's exactly what it says here. By this we know love because he laid down his life for us. It's intentional. He laid it down. It wasn't something that was taken from him. When Jesus was defining it, he said it in John 10, I lay my life down that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down down of myself. Jesus did it purposely, intentionally. He did it because he was showing that love, and so he's helping us to understand this right now, that when we think about what love is, it is perfectly shown to us in Christ, a genuine and a real love. He says, you know, we know what love is 
because we've seen it in Jesus. But grab this with me. When he tells us that at the beginning of verse 16, and he says, by this we know love, he's not just talking about knowing it intellectually, not just talking about seeing it. He's talking about knowing it actually. That because Jesus laid his life down for us, because he died on the cross for us, for those of us who know him, his love is now imparted into us. That that love that we see now becomes his love at work in our lives. I think about it this way. Again, in that passage in Romans, I just quoted from a moment ago, I go to another verse there. And it says, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Powerful to then understand. So the love that he talks about in Romans 5 here, which is God demonstrated his love for us in giving his son for those of us who are unworthy. He says, well, if you got saved, if you're a follower of Jesus, something happened in that moment. Not only were your sins taken care of, not only were you made new, but God then took his love and by the power of the Holy Spirit, pours it inside your heart so that that love becomes something that is known by you, not just because you see it, but because you experience it. Because it's now part of who you are. That love is genuine at work in your life. Now, that's important. We'll come back to this before we're done this morning, but I want to make sure that you see it. So love is known by us. We, we get a chance to see it in Jesus. We get a chance to know what this love is because of Christ. We never would have seen it outside of it. And there's no way we ever could have known it if Jesus hadn't given his life for us. It's because of the gospel. It's because of what he does that brings us into this reality of knowing his love. Well, out of that, he is now challenging us to love. You guys have already seen it, but again, I want you to see it again. Please notice verse 16. By this, we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He is now calling you and I to love Christians, to love the brethren the way that Jesus loves us, that the love that he has given us now is on display in the way that we love others. Now, let me just pause and say this. We're called to love people. When the Bible talks about love, it's not, you know, we're called to love everybody. I mean, there, there isn't a place where we could, you know, well, we don't love everybody. I mean, the, the, the Pharisees tried that with Jesus, and he gave them the parable of the Good Samaritan. He says, hey, just go out and love. I mean, you, 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 there's not anybody that doesn't fall into that equation. We think about it when Jesus would call us to love our enemies. He said, the world can love those who love them. I want you to love those who hate you. And, and so certainly we're called to that. We're called to love the poor and care for the poor. Jesus said, the poor we would have with us always. Draw your attention to that because in one sense, we're going to look at this, these verses this morning and it's going to tell us, you know, to care for those in need. And sometimes we read that and immediately go there. And sometimes that can be there, but please understand this. That's not what this text is talking about. We are to love everybody and we are to love the world and we are to love the poor. That's genuinely meant to be a part of our lives that said, it's not our subject this morning. It's not what this text is talking about. Instead, what he is talking about is the love that we have for other Christians, the love that we have for believers. That's the way he refers to it. Again, as he says it there in verse 16, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And brethren there is a term that's used for Christians. It's used for the way that we, we love those who are other people, just other believers in Christ. A love that in the body of Christ is distinctive and real and rich. In other words, this love that we're talking about this morning, this love that is to exist between Christians is richer and more full more real than the love even that we're supposed to have for the world. That there is something, again, that Jesus would say, hey, this is how the world's going to recognize you. They're going to know that you're my disciples because you guys love each other. Because there's love happening between Christians in a way that defines that love of God. I think about how he gives it to us in Galatians, where it says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Like, yeah, like everybody. Like we should be, as, when we have opportunity, we should do good where we can, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Especially, I mean, really to Christians. I mean, yeah, everybody, love everybody, but man, especially you love other Christians, especially do that. In fact, it's kind of fun to think about it this way. You guys know 
the, the most famous verse in Scripture is probably John 3, 16. Many of you guys could quote it by heart, right? Where it tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Incredible. God's love that caused him to give Jesus. I just want you to take this as a little bit of a, of a fun reality or technical. It might work for somebody. It's really good to connect John 3.16 with 1 John 3.16. That John 3.16 says, hey, God so loves the world. 1 John 3.16 says, and you go and do likewise. You go and take that same thing, that by this we know love, because he laid down his lives for others. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. That the same love that's on display in God, in Christ, is a love that now he's calling us to have. That he's calling us to have that work inside of our lives. So this love that's supposed to be there for believers, that the challenge here in this text specifically, is that it actually be very, very practical. Or it might just notice how he said it down there in verse 18. It says, My little children... Let us not love in word or tongue, or the idea is not only in word or tongue, but in deed and in truth. He says, I want to make sure that your love is not just words. It should be in deed and it should be in truth. Let's actually break those apart. Let's just talk about deeds for a moment. He says, I want you to love in deed. I want your love to be love that is actionable, action-based love, that love is being defined by something that you're actually doing. In so doing, you might just notice that he does something kind of fascinating. He moves from this plural, kind of embracing that we're supposed to love the brethren, to now being displayed in a single brother. Notice again, just at the end of verse 16, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, plural. Then in verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother. Pause there just for a moment, because it's kind of a fascinating thing that he takes this, you know, hey, you want you to love God's people, I want you to love all of God's people, and then he says, okay, but that's going to be in display in individual cases, that you're going to love people in an individual way, and that's what's needing to happen. Now, I just think this is a pretty powerful way to say it, and maybe the better way to say it is to use another quote. C.S. Lewis, in talking about this, said, it's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, and otherwise unattractive. You know, it's just real easy to say, like, I love people. I just don't like people. Uh, you know, I just, I mean, I love everybody, but I don't, like, I don't like them, you know, I mean, as if somehow getting individual becomes a part of it. He says, loving everybody in a general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular, and it's a good challenge. He says, I'm not just talking about you loving everybody, you're just saying, I want to talk about individual ways that this is supposed to be on display in your life, that it's meant to be particular ways that are working its way out. So as we wrap our minds around this, let me come at it this way. Maybe in an oversimplification, there are at least three things that are needed for this love to be in action. There's three things that are needed for love to be indeed in our lives. And so let me kind of clean up the screen just so I have a little bit of space there. And let's just talk about what these three things are. And then we'll talk about how this text points it out. So one of the first things that would be needed is that you would need to be aware of that. You know, our text tells us if you see your brother in need. I mean, there ought to be a sense of a recognition of that. Well, to that end, there are really two things that would be a part of that. One, you need to listen. You need to be able to listen to what people are having. And the second, you need to be able to, a person that shares that so that other people can listen. That there is a sense of what's needed is a place where needs and, and knowing one another is taking place in the midst of the body of Christ. Now, that might sound simplistic. And it might sound, well, of course, Jim, but I want you to understand. I think it's greatly being pressed against in our world. Sometimes I think about it this way, that in our world right now, if you could see it, you know, we often talk about the, just the real simple place that, that God tells us that there are two great commandments, love God, love people, right? Love God is the first one, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus says that's the greatest commandment. Then he said, the second is like it, that you love people. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, if you do these two things, you got the whole thing. Like everything in the Bible is about teaching you how to love God and love people. It's everything that is being built there. That's true. So if you could see it this way, God is drawing you to connection. He's drawing you to be connected to him and to connected to people. If you could see that, then understand that sin and Satan and the world, it's going in the opposite direction. It's trying to keep you from people and keep you from God. It's disconnecting you, so it's making you isolated and and separate. Now, that's what sin does. That's what the world's doing. That's what Satan is working at. And if you could see that all by itself, it would be helpful. There's a lot of that that's outside of your control. There's a lot of that that's not in your power to change or fix that. But what I want to talk about is when it is in your control. Some of you were with us last Wednesday when we were in Proverbs chapter 18, or the Wednesday before this last Wednesday, where at the beginning of it, it said, a man who isolates himself, seeks his own desire, and he rages against all wise judgment. This is a really powerful proverb. So he says, if you're doing it to yourself, like, it's not the world doing it to you, it's not Satan doing it to you, you are choosing to isolate yourself. First of all, he says, you are seeking your own desire. What does that mean? It means you're choosing your own path in contrast or in rebellion against God's path. I think about how he gives it to us in the book of Isaiah. You know, all we like sheep have gone astray, each one of us choosing his own way. It's as if, okay, God says, this is what I want for you. I want you to go down this path, which is loving God and loving people. And you say, hmm, I'd rather go down this path. (laughs) You know, I'm going to choose my own way. I'm going to do life, you know, on my own design. Not only are you choosing your own path against God's place, but he says when you do that, it's as if you're raging against all wise, all godly judgment. It's as if you're shaking your fist against God and saying, no, like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go your way. I don't want the path you want for my life. I want my own thing. He says when you choose to isolate yourself, that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're telling God, I, re- I reject your plan. I reject your ways. I reject what you have for my life. I'm, I'm saying no to that. And God is calling us into a space that instead of doing that, we are pressing into a place where instead of isolating, we're connecting. In fact, I think about it. In one of those well-known verses that has been popular in these last couple years, in Hebrews 10, verse 25, it says that we are not to be those who are forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. He says, here's the thing, I don't want you to do this. He says, I don't want you to be those who are disconnecting from, from God's people, this place where you're forsaking the assembling. He says, I want you to do this, and he seems to infer that as the days get closer to Jesus coming back, that this would become a more common and real struggle. And it says, as you see the day approaching, you're going to have to fight this all the more. And I honestly believe those are the days that we're living in. That one of the big struggles is that it's that pushing us away from this place of being connected as a body of Christ. Hey, more on that in a moment, but let me back up because you might just notice that at the beginning of verse 25 here, it's not the beginning of the sentence. It begins at a lowercase letter because the sentence actually began in verse 24. So let me back up. Verse 24 begins it this way. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about each other. I want you to think about each other. I want you to do so not to critique each other or criticize each other or pick on each other. I want you to think about other believers and I want you to be asking, what could I do that would encourage them? How could I stir them up to love and good works? Is there, is there something that I could do in the lives of others that I could, could, could think about who they are? That there is a sense of calling us to have a heart that is this heart that is concerned and is caring for other people. Yeah, he's calling us to have that kind of mentality as a church, that he's telling us that one of the things that we're supposed to do is to make this a part of what it is to be a part of the body of Christ, that we think about each other. And we're trying our best to connect and and be a part of that. Now, I don't know. Maybe I'm saying this and you're like, well, Jim, I do that. And that's a big part of my life. I I don't know why I wouldn't. Well, great. That's good. But maybe you're not. And, And we live in a world that is becoming more rare. So many things are pressing against it. And I just want you to see it. 
Now, I'm thinking about this, and I thought, hey, this might be a good chance for me just to segue and kind of go into an issue that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but it'll help understand what I'm saying. So we think about where we are right now in this generation, and some of you know you've been with us for a while, and you might remember when this whole COVID thing, lots of things changed, and, and we did some different things. And before COVID, we used to have this place in our service that we called a meet and greet time. It's time we're right, like right in the middle of the announcement time, we told everybody, get up and, and, and greet one another. And some of you are like, I remember that. Like, Jim, when are we ever going to go back to that? Well, let me just pause and say this. You know, when we stopped it, it was not just for COVID. I mean, honestly, we were thinking about it at that point in time, and we're still thinking about it. And I know this. I know that right now some of you are like, I'm going to send them an email. Send me an email. Like, give me your opinion. I'm good with that. I just want to tell you we're wrestling with it. But we put a stop to it not just for COVID, but honestly, some of you love it. And you know who you are. You're like the extrovert people. I mean, you love people. I mean, you're like, give me a chance. and and In one minute, I can hug 20 people, you know. (laughs) It's a great deal. But I just know not all, there are others of you that that moment, it was like pure torture. It was kind of like that moment when you sit in the dentist's office and you're like, get it over with. <laughs> like, just do it, okay? Like, how long is this going to wait? You know, because I'm just dying inside. And you know who you are. Honestly, we actually had people that were coming late to church just to miss the meet and greet time. They're like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be a part of that. So I wrestle, I've been wrestling with that for a little bit of time. So we haven't reinstituted that because we really want this to be a place that you're invited into the body of Christ. And honestly, in the one minute we gave, it wasn't really enough time to truly connect. So we've started doing it differently. And you might have already figured it out. But for the last couple months, we've been ending our service. And I've been saying something to the effect of, hey, don't run. Don't leave out of here really quickly. Meet somebody. Just take a moment and find somebody you don't know, greet them, maybe get to know them, maybe ask them how I can pray for you. And the interesting thing is it's actually been happening. And honestly, I think it's a little bit more authentic. I think it has a little bit more space where it's like, hey, I could just turn around and talk to somebody for a second. And we just want to say, that's why we're doing it. We're trying to create space where you could listen to somebody. At the same moment, you could share. And somebody could ask you like, hey, is there something I can pray for you? You could say, yeah, you could pray for this in my life. But see, that's what we're wanting it to be. Now, it's not the only time that can happen. If, you, if you're like, Jim, I don't like that. I still leave out of here quickly. That's fine. I mean, that's fine. But if you're doing that in every part of your life, if there's not anybody here in the body of Christ that knows you, I mean, right now, is there, is there anybody here that would say, oh, I know what you're going through. I, I know how to pray for you. I, I know what's happening in your life. If there's not anybody that, you, that knows you, then that's a problem. You're not sharing. And that, how, how are we ever to be a body of Christ if you're not doing that? And if you don't know anybody else, I mean, if you're like, I, if there's not anybody else that you're like, oh, yeah, I, I, I know, you know, I can't, I can't know everybody, <laughs> but I could know two or three or four, and I could know what's happening in their life, and I could care about what's happening in their life. Yeah, that's part of what it is to be the body of Christ. It doesn't have to happen at church. It can happen in your home. It can happen in, in your neighborhood if you know other believers, but it needs to happen. Because that's part of what it is to be the body of Christ. And so all of that to simply say, hey, we need to be aware of each other's needs. We need to be aware of what's taking place because nobody's being meant to do life alone. Nobody's meant to do Christianity or this thing alone. So you need to know the need. But there's another thing that you need. You need to be able to meet the need. I mean, I think about how he gives it to us in our text and it just says it, you know, this way in verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods. I mean, you have what's there to meet the need. Now, he's using a single part of the illustration, but I do believe it's bigger, so let me just say it this way. There's a lot of ways we meet needs. Yes, there are physical ways that we meet needs, and sometimes it can be money. I mean, just you have this world's goods, and and you see somebody in need, and sometimes that's part of what it is to be a body in Christ, that we are able to financially partner in and help in things, whether it be here locally or in Ukraine or anywhere else. Sometimes, yeah, it's being displayed in money. Other times, it's time where it's like, hey, you know, they just need somebody to come over and, and help them out and just help for a moment. Sometimes it's just investing into each other's lives, and sometimes it's a physical thing we give. Other times, it's an emotional thing. Sometimes it's just caring. Sometimes it's just caring about somebody. And just saying, hey, I just want to hear how you're doing. I just want to know you. And sometimes just being known is is so much a part of it, to have people that know that. In fact, one of the things that's interesting in that whole process, they'll sometimes call that the ministry of presence. That just, just the place of being there is powerful in and of itself. I hope you know what that is. It's the kind of thing that sometimes just as people are going through life, maybe it's in a hospital or maybe they're going through things, 
Sometimes you, have, you don't even know what to say. And you're like, I, I just don't even know what to say. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just be there. Just saying, hey, I'm with you. <laughs> you're not alone. You know, we're not, you're not going through this alone. I want, to, I want you to know that. I mean, I think about Jesus who said that he would be this, that he is God with us, that he is the one that would come and be there. And there is a place that some of that is emotional. Other times it's spiritual. We, we think about the, the, the th- ways that we can meet people's needs and maybe one of the big ones is praying for each other. I could go through a long time telling you the number of Bible verses that tell us to do this, that we are to pray one for another. That as a body in Christ, specifically, he says, I want you to be praying for each other. That is certainly true. And again, it's a powerful reality. I hope it's happening. Again, I hope there's somebody in this church that is praying for you. I hope somebody knows what you're going through right now, because you're all going through stuff. And if nobody is praying for you, you're not doing a good job sharing, or we're not doing a good job listening. But I hope you're also praying. I mean, there's sometimes you're praying for big things. Maybe you're part of their prayer chain, and you get those. Those are great. But I hope you know just a couple of people are like, I'm just praying for them, you know, I'm just praying for what's happening in their family or their jobs or their health, and, and, and there's something about praying, because prayer is powerful. Let me add to that, that there's another part of investing into each other's life that is spiritual or spiritual gifts. Paul would give it to us, I'm sorry, Peter would give it to us this way, 1 Peter 4, as each one, in fact, it's very intensive in the Greek, as each and every one of us in Christ has received a gift, that is a spiritual gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. It says every one of us has this investment of the Spirit of God inside of us. Peter goes on to say some of you are speaking and some of you are serving. Really falls into those two categories. Either God has given you something to say or he's given you something to do. And he says, do that. Take what God has given you and then minister it to one another that you would say, okay, I'm going to love God's people with what God has given me. I'm going to take what he's invested into me spiritually, and I'm going to be investing that into God's people. I think that's powerful. In fact, you know, I think about this whole thing, this place of where he's calling us to, it's part of what makes it so real. So we have this awareness, we have this ability, but the third one, maybe it makes the most sense, but really it's really the push of our text, which he's saying to us, actually do it. <laughs> I mean, don't just, don't just have the ability and don't just know about it, but actually meet those needs. Let me go back to a verse I gave you a second ago. In Hebrews, we have this amazing verse that says, okay, we're not to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. Like, some people are going this direction, but it shouldn't be us. Instead, we ought to be exhorting or encouraging one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Notice with me that first description where he says, I don't want you to be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And I want you to think about the word assembling because it's a really, really powerful word. But if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it. Let me just say it this way. Assembling is much more than gathering. Assembling is much more than gathering. You can gather together as a church and still not be assembled. You could be in the same space, but not actually assembling. Think about it through a couple different illustrations. Maybe you go and you buy a bicycle, and you get it in the box, right? And you see those words on the side of the box, some assembly required. (laughs) Those are scary words for some of us, by the way. And you take the box and you dump it out. You could gather all the pieces of that bicycle together, and it's not a bike. And it's not really going to do anything. It's not really going to be helpful until you assemble it. That is, you put it together where every part doing what it's meant to do. Each piece is not only being what it's been, it's connected in the right way, in the right space with the other pieces so that all together it can become a very powerful instrument. Yeah, being assembled is different than being gathered. You could go and buy a puzzle and you could dump all the pieces of the puzzle on a table and you could gather them together and it's not a puzzle. It's not till you put it together where each piece is where it's meant to be, connecting to the part that it's meant to connect to. You could gather together to cook, to cook a meal, and you could gather all the ingredients on the counter. It's not a meal. It's gathered. It's not a meal. It's not a meal till it's assembled. You have to put it in the right measure, in the right space, at the right time, in the right way, and then it can become an amazing meal. Assembling is so much more than just gathering. He's saying, I want you to be plugging in to the body of Christ the way you should, in the spaces you should, in the, in the means that you should. He's saying that's what should happen. And if that happens, it's so beautiful. 
In Ephesians 4, he goes and he talks about the purpose of the church and all the different things that churches are given through. And then its final statement is one of my favorite statements that picture this. It gives it to us this way. It says, from whom, that is from Christ, the whole body, like all, the, all Christianity, is joined and knit together by which every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which each, which every part does its share. And it causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself, notice, in love. I don't know how to say it better. I'm just going to tell you this verse is one that I could sit there and just gaze at with incredible desire. Maybe it's because I'm a pastor. I don't know. But I could just sit there and just almost weep over this verse. Like, wow, that'd be amazing. I mean, if you could, if you could see that. If the whole body were just every part being who they've been made to be in Christ and they're all loving on each other with the way that God has them to love each other and the whole body is growing together and edifying itself in love, he says, that's what we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And so that's what's in focus here in this text in 1 John. He's saying, I want you guys to actually do this. I want you to be aware of things. I want you to meet those needs and I want you to be those who actually do it. Now, I think about it. In this whole place where he's calling us to love indeed, it is that idea that we are actually doing it that is probably the primary focus. And so you read it again there in verse 17. He just says, But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart with him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. I think about it this way, and James says much the same thing. Some of you already thought about it because you know that out of the book of James, and you're like, doesn't James say the same thing? He does. He says, if a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you goes and you say to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what good is that? Like, what, what profit is that? I mean, you're not, I mean, it's like, hey, you know, go be warm. It's like, well, you, did, you, just, you, you said it, you didn't do it then, it, then there's something wrong with that. There's something missing in that. And so that's what he's saying here for us is, hey, you need to be one that in your life that you're actually loving more like Jesus. Now, we already talked about it, right? Jesus's love for us was given to us because we didn't deserve it. He did it sacrificially. He did it intentionally. And there's no doubt that the way that you and I are being called to love is the same way. It's not the kind of thing where it's like, well, they deserve it. <laughs> I should love them because they deserve it. It's like, they don't deserve it. Is it sacrificial? Yeah. Sometimes it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you effort. It might cost you money. It might cost you heart. Yeah. But you're meant to do it intentionally because Jesus did. He said, no, I'm, nobody's making me do this. I'm choosing to lay my life down. I want to lay my life down for my brethren. I want, to, I want to be a part of that. And so he is calling us to that. Again, maybe saying it in another way. Kent Hughes said, I sometimes think fundamentally that some of us really would like nothing better in this world than to purchase a life membership in the Association of Bystanders. Like, I just, I just, I'm, just, I'm just watching. I'm just on the side. I don't really want to play. He says, but we can't just give lip service to love. It must, we must do something about it. If it's really love, it, it has to be translated into action. If it's really the love of God in our life, then it needs to work its way out practically, which is what he's here calling. He says, don't just talk about it. I want you actually to do it. I want you to actually show that love. Now, at the same moment, he's saying something else. And again, we already talked about it, but just notice it again. There, verse 19. I'm sorry, in verse 18. He says, my little children, let us not love in word or tongue, but in deed, like actually do something, and in truth. And in truth. Well, let's come back to this because we started to talk about this a few moments ago. The love that he's calling us for is a genuine love. It's a love that's real inside of us. It's a love that isn't something that we're just doing. He's not just calling us to activity. He's calling us to a love that's real. And so he puts it to us in a question. He says, if you see your brother in need and you're not meeting those needs, he says, here's the thing. You have really shut up your heart. You, you've, really, you, you've really done this in a way. And he just asks the question, well, how, how, how does the love of God work there? Again, you guys saw it, but it's maybe helpful to see the text again. Go back and see it when he says it exactly that way in verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and he shuts up his heart from him, 
how does the love of God abide in him? I think you guys get it, right? You got to understand, this is one of those rhetorical questions that the answer is it doesn't. I mean, if it's not translating into action, that's not the love of God. I mean, the, the, the love of God cannot be abiding in somebody if it's not working its way out practically. Well, that raises a couple questions. And the first one is, is he saying that that person is unsaved? And the answer might be yes. The answer might be is if this is not actively happening in somebody's life, if they're not somebody who has both found themselves in a relationship with Jesus that saves them, but connects them to the body of Christ into a way that now they're actually practically loving each other, then maybe you're not actually saved. Again, I, w- I want to wish I could say that somehow better. I'm looking for the right way to say it, but here's the deal. This would be a very gracious and helpful thing. If this is you this morning, if you're here and you're like, you know, I prayed a prayer. <laughs> I think I'm going to heaven. I just don't like people. I don't even like the church. I don't like being around people. Nobody knows me. I'm not a part of that. John is saying, then you're not saved. And, and that's not meant to be cruel. It's meant to say you need to get saved. Because if you're saved, then God's love is inside of you, and there's no way that it's not going to change you. He's not telling you that you, you know, do these things to earn your salvation. He's not giving us a salvation by works. But maybe it's a way of saying it's a salvation that works. It's a salvation that it's impossible. That if God's love is inside of you, it's going to do something. It's going to change you. I mean, it's going to change who you are. It's going to change how you feel. It's going to change things that you do because that's the power of the love of God. It has to be there. And so if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, then today we call you to Jesus. And think about all of this. James tries to say the same thing, where if you are that person who says to somebody in need, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you don't give them the things which are needed for the body, James says, what does it profit? And he just gives it as an explanation. He says, thus also faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, it's not really faith. It's dead. It's not a faith that earns salvation. It's a salvation that changes. He says, if it hasn't changed you, then you're not really saved. And, and the great need would then to be saved, to be really brought into the love of God, where it would radically change and transform your life. And again, if that is you, we are pleading for your salvation, even today. And today, would long that you give your life to Jesus, and we'd love to talk to you more about that. Now, that doesn't have the idea that a Christian can't sometimes find themselves here. In fact, the idea is that sometimes it could. We could be the ones that God's love is being shut down in our lives, that God's love is being quenched because, see, here's the deal. Real Christian love motivates. So if you're a Christian and you're not seeing love being translated into action in your life, then somewhere you are broken and that love is being quenched. In fact, again, I love the way it said it there in verse 17. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need shuts up and shuts up his heart. And there's this picture that your heart has been locked down. But please understand it. Your heart is locked down from God's love. God's love being in the midst of it. Jesus would say it this way. He says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He says, If you're here and you're thirsty and you find yourself thinking, My soul's empty, my life is empty, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm hungry for Jesus. I'm hungry for hope. I'm hungry for help. He says, then come. Come and drink. I have what you need. I have the source of abundance that is you. Come to me and come to me and drink. Then he says, and if you believe, then rivers of living water are going to flow out of you. Now, the connection is beautiful. He says, if you're drinking, then the water is going to flow through you. If you're allowing God's love to flow in you, then it's going to flow through you. There is no other option. There is no like, oh, I'm just taking it all in. <laughs> I, just, I just take it all in and I don't actually do anything. It says it can't actually happen. It's an impossibility. So if it's not flowing out, you've, you've quenched it up here. You, you've quenched the love of God. You've, you've quenched it so that you're not, not allowing that to be a part of you. And so in part of it, he's telling us, hey, you need to kind of, you know, you need to both God's love flow in you and then out of you. Because the scripture says, out of your heart will flow these rivers of living water. It's meant to be that way. And he's calling us to that. And it helps us again understand that what he's calling for us isn't just actions. This isn't kind of like a, a salvation by works, like, hey, do these things and, you'll, and, and you can be saved. But he's saying, I want it to be real. I mean, this thing is a real thing that will change the way you interact. 
because the love of God is inside of you and it's flowing in and out through you. And he says, you want that. It's a, it's a true thing. It's not a plastic. It's not hypocritical. It's not something that's fake. It is actually real. Well, good stuff. I mean, it's amazing things that he's calling us to, this love that he has for us. But in the context of it, he's driving a thought. So go back and see it. Pick it up in verse 19. He says, and by this, by what? By loving each other, by actually loving in word and deed, by this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. He says, this kind of love gives you an assurance of your salvation, which is an amazing reality. Now, we're going to come back and talk about this more next week, and we'll talk about how we can have assurance and what assurance is. It's just worth noting right now that it does exist, that God longs for you to have an assurance. But one of the things that gives us assurance of our salvation is this actual reality. It says that you actually are loving God's people not just in word, but in deed and truth, it's one of the things that confirms to you that you're actually a part of it. Now, it's such an amazing reality, and I'm trying just to think about how to say it. Once Billy Graham was asked, like, how did he know that Jesus was actually alive? Like, how did he know that Jesus rose from the grave? And he simply answered, and he said, you know, I can tell you that Jesus is alive because I talked to him this morning. I mean, he's like, you know, it's like, I could give you other things. I could talk to you about the proofs of the Bible. I could talk to you about all the witnesses, but I have an actual relationship with him, and I know him. And, and maybe the greatest reality that convinces me that he's alive is because of this relationship. So how do you know that you are actually a part of the body of Christ? Be a part of the body of Christ. I mean, it becomes the thing that confirms it. It's the actual place where you're a part of the body of Christ, where you're living as a part of the body of Christ, that proves it to you, and you don't need like a paper, you don't need something that says it, it's because you're doing it. And again, just silly illustration, it's not going to just, I, I think about it. So how do I know that I'm actually a grandpa? Now, I am a grandpa, in case, in case you guys are wondering. My second grandson was born two, week, two weeks ago, so I have two grandsons. Now, you could ask me, like, how do you know that you're a grandpa? And I could tell you, um, I held him yesterday. Like, I was in my, I mean, I, every couple of days, you know, I'm kind of, in, and then I FaceTimed with my first one, you know, like every couple of days. I mean, I'm involved in their life. The greatest proof that I'm a grandpa is I'm actually a grandpa. Like, I actually am invested into their lives, and I don't need anything else. I wouldn't need a piece of paper or any other, it's like, um, because I am. <laughs> like, like I, I mean, this is the greatest thing about, just, I, I know I am because I'm actually am, and I'm a part of it. But let's just say I didn't. Let's say I had no relationship with my grandkids and you came over to my house and I had one of those like framed pictures and I'm like, oh, this is my grandson. And you're like, oh, cool. Do you know him? Nope, never met him. Don't know him. And you're like, so are you sure, Jim, that you didn't just buy the picture at Walmart, you know? <laughs> and the picture was in the frame. You know, they come with pictures there. It's like, oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's like, that's I, being silly, but if that's all that you had, it would be that way. But if you could say, no, that's, I don't, I'm in it. I mean, I know I'm a part of the body of Christ because I'm a part of the body of Christ because they love me and I love them and I'm enjoying it and I enjoy what this is. And, and that display not only is wonderful, but it defines me. It, it's one of the ways that I know that I'm saved, but it's also one of the ways they know that I'm saved, right? Let's go back to where we began. I think about that quote from Tertullian when he came in and investigated the early church, and he just said, you know, see how these Christians love one another. I mean, this is like someone from the outside, not a Christian, coming into a church, and he's like, you know, I don't understand you guys, but you guys love each other. Would it not be amazing if that's what Roswell knew of you and me? It's like, I don't know, but you guys have something there that is really interesting. I don't see that anywhere else. You guys have a love that loves each other, and it's, somehow it, it impacts me, and I see that, and see, that's exactly what Jesus told us. He says, here's how all will know that you're my disciples. If you actually do this, if you love each other, if you love one another, the world will be looking on and be in awe at what you have, and that's what John is calling us to. That's what he's telling you and me that we need, that we need to be living in this because it defines us. It defines who we are. It gives us assurance. It gets the world clarity about who we are. And so without a doubt, you are being called into this place that you are meant to love each other. So 
let's begin to wind it down this morning and, and, and try to think about this. And let me just give it to you in an overly simplistic way. This morning, you're in one of three places. You're in one of three places. Either this is you. Like, not perfectly, because none of us got it down perfectly, but you're like, that's, that's me. <laughs> I, I, I love God, and I actually love God's people. I really do. It's kind of crazy. And yeah, I'm involved in people's life. There's two or three people I'm praying for, and there's somebody who's probably praying for me. And, and, and yeah, I know what this is. And you would say, yeah, one of the greatest proofs of being a part of the body of Christ is I'm really a part of it. And if you're in that space, can I just say, well done, keep doing it. Like, do better. I mean, that's how we're supposed to be known. But maybe you're here this morning, you're like, I'm, I know Jesus, but it's not going really well. I mean, I'm, I've, I've, maybe I have isolated myself. Maybe I've cut myself off from God's people. And I just want to tell you, then you shut your heart down. And I'm hoping you to see it, that this is not a secondary issue. It's a primary thing. This is how we know. This is how the world knows. And so if it's not happening inside of you, then what you need is to kind of unstick that kink. You know, say, okay, God, then I need your love. Pour your love inside me by the power of the Holy Spirit so that it can flow out of me and then begin seeking to actively do it. I mean, where you're going to say, okay, God, show me somebody to pray for. Show me somebody to care for. I'm, I'm going to come to church and I'm going to look for somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to do what Hebrews said. I'm going to consider somebody. I'm going to think, is there anybody that I could encourage? Is there somebody I can do something for? I'm, I'm looking for something because I want to display God's love. And I'm inviting you to where that would become a more real part of your life. And for some of you, it needs to open up. And it would become a place where pretty soon you would do it, because not just because it's right, but because this is so much fun. I mean, God's love pours in, and the, lo the love is flowing out. It's such a good thing, and I want that to be me. So if it's, if it's in any way just choked up in your life, then today's a good day to, to deal with that. But maybe, again, you're over here on the third side, and it's not you. And the weird thing is you may be religious. Maybe you've gone to church your whole life. And, and you're kind of like, well, I prayed a prayer. You know, I, I kind of, you know, I, I, you know I, probably Jesus is God. Isn't that enough? No. You need to be saved. You know, Jesus said there's a whole group of people that are going to get to him in the last days, and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, <laughs> you know, I know your name. You know, Lord, Lord, let me in. He's going to like, uh, you didn't do it. You know, did you, did you not think we actually meant, you know? Yeah, yeah I want you actually to, to be this. And he's going to say, hey, depart from me. I don't know you. And, and so this really, if you're in this space right now, then some of this would do just expose that and say, you need to know him. Yeah, this is how we know love. It's Christ. It's coming into a relationship with him that would bring us to that and save us. And so if that is you this morning, then we're inviting you to give your life to Christ. So we're going to take a quiet moment as we do at the end of our, our messages on Sunday morning, and I'm inviting you to pray. And I'm just saying maybe it's one of those three. Maybe you're doing well and you just want to say, God, help it keep going. Or maybe you're not doing well and you need to ask God to just, you know, unstick the cork, as it were, and say, God, fix this in me. Or maybe you need to be saved. And it's a good day for you right now to surrender your life to Jesus. So in a quiet moment, uh, our desire is that you would pray about what he has spoken to you about this morning, that you would ask him, to do this inside of you. So quietly, would you do that? I'll do the same, and we'll close in prayer and worship in just a moment. God, it's just simply true. We never would have known love outside of Jesus. We never would have understood what real love looks like, and we never would have experienced it. But in Christ, we know love. We are loved, and your love becomes real inside of us. God, I simply pray that you would take John 3.16 and empower 1 John 3.16 
in our lives, that we would love one another, that we would also love as you have loved us. God, would that work out practically, that it would really work out indeed? Not just word, not just saying it, but we would really be those who love one another. Teach us how to do that. Teach us how to grow in that. And do it in such a way that the world notices. That the world would look on and do what you said, Jesus. That they would look upon and know that we're yours because of the way we love each other. Teach us how to do that. Grow us in that. In the reality of the love of God. I ask for it for me and for all of us now. And ask for it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May God meet you in that. May he grow you in the reality of the love of God. If you need to talk to somebody about Christ, if you have questions, make your way up here after the service. We'll have people here who would love to answer questions and pray with you. But here's my encouragement that I've been encouraging for the last couple weeks, the last couple months. Hey, don't leave right away if you have time. Take a moment and just maybe meet somebody you haven't met before. Maybe just take a moment and just introduce yourself or get to know them and, and maybe even go past just the pleasant trees and you could even ask them, hey, is there one thing I could be praying for you this week on? Is there something happening in your world that I could just be a part of? And that would be an amazing part as we do just connect together as the body of Christ. And I invite you to do that in just an authentic and real way. Well, that is an encouragement. Why don't you stand? We're going to close and just offer this up to God in worship. And before we do that, I just want to bless you in his name. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you 